Plus Numérique Agro Paris Tech est allé à Londres rencontrer le docteur Stéphanie Bayol au Collège Vétérinaire Royal qui va nous expliquer le long de ce reportage l'objet de ses travaux sur la grossesse, la junk food et l'obésité. Hi, I'm Stephanie Bayle. Welcome to the Royal Veterinary College. Let's get started. So the Royal Veterinary College was established um, in the, during the 18th century and the main purpose of the college is to train um, vet students uh, at the career of uh, veterinary medicine. But here uh, we're in the Department of Veterinary Basic Sciences and basically uh, a wide range of research in a wide range of research topics uh, is being carried out in the department. Today I'm going to tell you a bit about my work here at the Royal Vet College. Uh, so basically I work, um, my work is centered around examining the influence of the maternal diet during pregnancy and lactation on the development of obesity in, uh, in the offspring. And um, so this, is, uh, this work is carried out in the context of the global obesity epidemic and therefore we used um, an animal model uh, whereby we give the rats a, a junk food diet during pregnancy and lactation and we look at the effect uh, of this diet on the offspring. Obesity is defined by the um, excess uh, body fat mass, which has accumulated over time to the extent that it can have a negative effect on health and life expectancy. So there are um, different methods for measuring obesity, but one of them is to calculate the body mass index. And by definition, obesity is uh, characterized by a body mass index in excess of 30. And more specifically, uh, abdominal obesity, so um, a weight a size greater than 90 centimeters for women or 100 centimeters for men, uh, is the one that is more closely associated with the metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular diseases. Obesity is a, is a global problem. Um, which affects um, uh, industrialized nation, Western nations such as the United States, um, European countries and, and Australia for example. But uh, nowadays uh, developing countries are also affected by uh, obesity and that's the case of uh, China for example, uh, Mexico and um, Egypt and, and other African nations. So it really is um, a global problem and people talk about a globesity problem affecting the entire world. The World Health Organization uh, estimates that by 2015 there will be around 2.3 billion um, uh, overweight adults uh, worldwide and around 700 million obese. Obesity is affecting uh, nations earlier in life and children are also uh, affected and the World Health Organization estimated that in 2005 there were around 20 million um, children under the age of five classified as overweight. European countries um, are affected by obesity, of course, but some countries are more affected than others. So, for example, um, France is, is one of the countries uh, with the lowest um, obesity rates in Europe, whereas the United Kingdom, uh, according to some studies, has the highest um, obesity rates in, in Europe. Obesity occurs when energy intake exceeds energy expenditure over a, a long period of time. So that looks like a, a simple equation, too much energy consumed, not, e e not enough energy spent. However, there are many factors that might explain why someone becomes um, obese and these factors can include genetic factors, but also uh, psychological factors and, and so, uh, social or cultural factors. So it really is um, a complex problem. 
A few genes now have been uh, linked to, um, to obesity. It's the case of the FTO gene, for example. But um, it looks as if genetics alone cannot explain why obesity rates have risen so sharply over the past few decades. Um, so it looks as if um, it could be something to do with an interaction between genes and the environment. An American study, for example, has shown that um, eating habits in the United States have changed quite dramatically over the past few decades and people nowadays consume a great proportion of away from home food, so foods prepared outside the home. And that's the case for um, uh, food consumed in restaurants, uh, food from takeaways, uh, vending machine, cafeteria and, and so on. Um, people also consume a great proportion of snacks and, and sugary drinks and all of these uh, changes in eating habits uh, are believed to contribute to the obesity uh, epidemic along with the fact that food energy supplies have also increased uh, quite dramatically over the past few decades. Foods prepared um, outside the home have been shown to contain a lot more fat, sugar and salt and, and they are more dense in energy uh, and therefore they believe to contribute to the uh, obesity epidemic. And despite being denser in energy, they are actually, some of them are deprived of vitamins and, and micronutrients found in wholesome food. So that brings us to the definition of junk food, which are food that are very high in energy, fat and sugar, but are um, deprived of vitamins and, and um, essential nutri nutrients found in wholesome food. And, and they bring, therefore, empty calories. So here at the RVC what we're trying to do is to um, uh, examine the influence of those um, junk foods, so those um, foods rich in energy, fat and sugar during pregnancy and lactation and their effect on the development uh, and growth of the offspring in the global obesity context. So um, perhaps we can go to the lab now and, and I can explain what we do in more detail. Here in the lab what we're trying to determine is the influence of the maternal diet during pregnancy and lactation on the development of obesity in offspring. So to, to do these sort of studies we use an animal model, so the rat, and what we do is we've got two different diets, a, a control diet which, is, um, um, which consists of a standard laboratory uh, rodent chow which is uh, balanced in terms of energy, fat, sugar and salt and, in an, another, um, and the other diet is based um, uh, on junk food items. So this diet is an adaptation of the cafeteria diet uh, model. So basically we use um, uh, foods that are designed for human consumption and which fall under the definition of junk food in the sense that they are uh, highly processed, they contain a lot of energy, a lot of fat, sugar and or salt. So in this model we use um, sweets, so marshmallows, um, some uh, different types of chocolate bars, biscuits, uh, some potato crisps which are rich in salt, some full fat cheese and, um, and muffins and donuts which are rich in, in sugar and saturated fat. So we've got um, different groups of rats so some uh, mothers receive the standard laboratory chow and other mums uh, receive the, the junk food uh, diet during pregnancy and lactation. And our attention has been focused on two groups of offspring. So both groups of offspring are given free access to junk food from weaning up to the end of adolescence. And the difference between these two groups is the maternal diet. So one group is born to mothers fed a healthy diet and the second group is born to mothers fed the junk food diet. And what we found was that those offspring born to mothers fed the junk food diet overrate and they developed a greater preference for junk food and they consumed a greater amount of, of this junk food and a greater intake of fat, sugar and all salt. 
and that as a result of this overeating, they uh, were overweight with a greater BMI by the end of adolescence compared with offspring also given free access to junk food but whose, but whose mothers were given a healthy balanced diet. So what we found as well is that those offspring born to junk food fed mothers um, also had uh, raised blood sugar levels, raised insulin, uh, triglycerides and cholesterol. Now these uh, blood parameters are closely linked to uh, the development of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases and therefore we found that being exposed to these junk food diets from the fetal life through the maternal diet um, uh, promoted a greater um, a, gr a great propensity for developing the metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular diseases by the end of adolescence. Because um, the metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular diseases are more uh, specifically associated with abdominal adiposity, we decided to examine uh, the level of abdominal adiposity in, in those offspring. So this is uh, roughly the amount of fat we um, we uh, got out the amount of abdominal fat uh, that was present in the control group so offspring born to mothers fed a healthy balanced diet which were also given the balanced diet from weaning up to the end of adolescence in the second group the rats are born to mothers fed the control diet and then at weaning they are given free access to junk food up to the end of adolescence so you can see they've got uh, more abdominal fat than the control but then in the last group we've got the amount of abdominal fat taken from uh, offspring born to mothers um, fed the junk food diet during pregnancy and lactation. So you can see that compared with the second group, they've got almost twice as much fat as uh, the second group born to mothers fed the healthy balanced diet. So basically being exposed to the junk food diet from fetal life through the maternal diet in pregnancy and lactation is promoting um, abdominal adiposity um, in offspring. Here we use a, a cryostat to prepare uh, microscopic slides to examine how the different diets uh, affect um, the cellular uh, structures of uh, various organs. So those, um, those slides are then taken um, and examined uh, under a microscope and we use a um, um, program or software to um, analyze th those images. Okay, so here we're in the uh, microscope room. So what we're doing here is we're using a microscope and uh, um, software which enables uh, the analysis of um, the image that we have captured uh, from the microscope. So what we do is we take the slides from uh, the cryostat onto the, the microscope and then we uh, use the computer to analyze the morphology of the cells and we can also um, carry out some measurements such as the measurements of the number of cells or the size of the cells and that uh, tells us how um, the, uh, the different diets influence um, the, the, the morphology and the histology of, of the tissue, the various tissues where we want to examine. So here we've got a picture of um, a slide taken from the control group and this is uh, abdominal adipose tissue. And what you can see here are um, adipocytes, so they're fat cells. Um, and they, they look like um, little sacs uh, filled with lipids. So this is from a control group. So offspring born to mothers fed the control diet and the offspring are themselves uh, fed the control diet from weaning up to the end of adolescence. So now here we've got uh, again a section uh, of abdominal tissue but this time taken from obese offspring fed the junk food diet from the fetal stage of life and you can see the, 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 pic the picture is taken at the same magnification and you can see that the hepatocyte, the, sorry, the adipocytes are much uh, larger than those in, in the control group. 
So what that says is that we saw, saw earlier that the exposure to a maternal junk food diet is promoting an increase in the mass of the abdominal uh, adipose tissue and this is also characterized by an increase in the size of the adipocytes so an increase in the fat cells that constitute uh, this fat depot. So in our studies we've also uh, looked at the effect of the maternal diet uh, on the liver and more specifically we've looked at a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, we normally tend to link um, liver disease with excessive alcohol consumption, but there are other conditions um, uh, of the liver that are linked to obesity and a high fat diet, and this is known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is characterized by an excess of fat in the liver and that can affect the, mor the morphology of the cells and that can also affect the normal function of um, liver cells and, and the liver as a whole organ. So here on this picture we've got an image of a control liver. So these are um, from of 10 week old offspring born to a mother fed the control diet and the offspring are themselves fed a control diet from weaning up to the end of adolescence. And you can see that this is the normal morpholo morphology of hepatocytes. The cytoplasm is very uh, homogeneous and uh, the staining is quite um, strong. And this is um, a section of liver taken from uh, obese offspring born to the mothers fed the junk food diet and these offspring are also themselves fed the junk food diet from winning up to the end of adolescence and you can see a striking difference um, in the morphology of the cells. So here for example you can see very large uh, vacuoles um, a large vacuole within the um, cytoplasm of the hepatocytes and this vacuole is pushing uh, the nucleus to the periphery of the cells and basically those vacuoles are forming as a result of um, excess uh, lipid accumulating uh, within the liver cells and that affects the morphology of the cells and in the long term that can affect also uh, their function. So here you've got some striking differences between the two groups and that implies that exposure to a junk food diet from the fetal stage of life through the maternal diet in pregnancy and lactation promotes um, symptoms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, by the end of adolescence in, in those offspring. Here we're in the uh, PCR room, so what we do in here, we use uh, real-time PCR to quantify the expression of certain genes uh, involved in the growth uh, and the metabolism of the tissues we're interested in, such as adipose tissue or the liver. So basically what we do is we try to quantify the, the amount of RNA present in the cell or in the tissue and for this we do a reverse transcription so we convert RNA into uh, DNA or cDNA and then we uh, quantify this uh, using the PCR or polymerase uh, chain reaction um, technique. Here we've got the real-time PCR program uh, attached to the machine and this program um, enables the quantification of, uh, and of the, the the PCR reaction and we've got a feature in this software in, and that's the, um, the the melting curve option so what we can do is carry out a melting curve uh, and this um, tells us that the um, reaction of amplification in each well uh, is specific so basically what the, the machine does it increases the temperature from 65 to 90 degrees and what happens is you get to the melting point where the DNA goes from a double-stranded form to a single-stranded form. So all the um, DNA strands come apart and um, they all come apart at the same temperature within each well. And that implies that the, um, each uh, gene amplified within each reaction is, is the same across the experiment. 
There's also a, a quantification feature, so we load some standards of non-concentrations within the reaction and uh, the standard curve is there then created by the software and then we can plot um, the values for the samples um, of interest that we want to quantify and uh, they show up on the standard curve here and the um, software can then calculate or quantify the amount um, of um, DNA and RNA that was present in the sample. So we use this method to quantify the amount, the, the gene expression levels of genes involved in the growth of tissue or the growth of the organs um, and also genes involved in the metabolism of the tissue or the pathological features of this tissue such as genes um, which indicate fibrosis of the tissue. So we go a step further into the molecular mechanism um, uh, associated with the, um, the, the junk food diet. So from the, the standard curve and the quantification curve, we can then plot the data onto graphs. And for example, here we've plotted the data for the expression of the uh, insulin receptor. So we can see here that the expression uh, of the insulin receptor is increased uh, in uh, male offspring fed the junk food diet at some stage during the study compared with the control group here uh, at the front. And um, here we can we found some uh, gender differences. So here we've got the male offspring and the female offspring. And in females, um, we tend to see the opposite. The females which are fed the junk food diet throughout the study show a reduction in the expression of the insulin receptor, uh, sorry, the insulin receptor in the, in the liver. The question is whether these can apply to the human because this is of course a rat study. So it's very difficult to, to carry out um, well-controlled um, studies in, in humans uh, such as these. But uh, we have uh, evidence from other studies that seem to imply that what happens in the rats also apply um, to humans. So for example, um, a study carried out in the States by Julie Menela has shown that um, women who were given um, carrot juice to drink during pregnancy and lactation gave birth uh, to children who were more likely to accept and like uh, the carrot juice when they were about three to five months of age. So that shows a link between the maternal diet in pregnancy and lactation and food preferences in young children. Uh, a similar observation has been made with um, aniseed uh, in, in France. And there's another study carried out in the UK that has shown a correlation between the intake of fat, protein and sugar during pregnancy and the preference and the intake of those macronutrients uh, in children at around uh, 10 years of age. So again, a correlation between the maternal diet and the food preferences um, in children. We also know from an American study that women who put on a lot of weight during pregnancy are more likely to have um, overweight children by the age of three to uh, five years. Maternal obesity is, um, is, is causing concerns. For example, in the UK, a study has shown that one in 20 um, pregnant women um, was obese. So quite a few people are uh, involved and obesity in pregnancy is um, associated with a poorer pregnancy outcome such as um, um, miscarriages or stillbirth or hemorrhages and, and so on. So um, it is important to try and lose weight before uh, getting um, pregnant. So from these measurements carried out in, in the labs, we can conclude that um, being um, exposed to a junk food diet from the fetal stage of life through the maternal diet in pregnancy and lactation can contribute to the development of obesity um, in offspring. And we've seen that by the end of adolescence, those of spring born to junk food fed mothers are more likely to develop uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, 
but also um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and, and probably other conditions. So it looks as if the maternal diet is involved in the development of uh, obesity earlier in life. We know that under-eating during pregnancy can, be, uh, can have a detrimental effect on, on the development of, uh, of the child. So it appears as if undernutrition as well as over-nutrition uh, during pregnancy um, can have a negative effect on the offspring. So from our studies and the studies of others, it appears as if, if there is um, one stage during a woman's life when she has to be uh, particularly uh, careful with her diet is actually during pregnancy and when breastfeeding because there's evidence that uh, a bad diet during pregnancy and lactation can affect the development of the offspring and have um, long-term consequences uh, for the health uh, of that uh, individual um, throughout their adult um, lifespan. We know that during the fetal life the um, organs uh, develop and for some organs uh, their development is pretty much uh, finished at the time of birth. So if these organs do not receive adequate nutrition during the fetal life then their function is likely to be impaired uh, on a long-term basis um, after birth. We'd like to thank uh, AgroParitech for coming uh, to the RVC and for showing their interest in our work um, carried out here. Thank you very much.